We've been fighting a long time, and we have all lost so very much, so many loved ones gone. But you are not alone. There are pockets of resistance all around the planet. We are at the brink. You have no idea how important you are. If you're listening to this, you are the resistance. Ave Maricela Dei Mater Alma Ad Semper Virgo Felix Semporta My thesis, to repeat myself, is that Mrs. Murphy is a liturgical theologian though not of the academic variety. Mrs. Murphy is a liturgical ascetic, though not of the monastic variety. And Mrs. Murphy is a liturgical mystic, though not of the, hmm, hmm, I'm stuck now for a word, theologian, but not scholastic, scholar, academic, um, ascetic but not monastic religious life mystic but not what word would i want to uh, contrast this to i think that i'm still working that out but the word i'm going to uh, choose for today is uh, not of the extraordinary variety she is an ordinary liturgical mystic that's my um, efforts here this is a uh, passage I wrote in a little book on uh, Alexander Schmemann, and uh, I liked the way it came out. A lot of things I say and write, I don't like the way they come out, but uh, when I do, then I'd like to hang on to them. Liturgical spirituality is not our accomplishment. Spirituality is the presence of the Holy Spirit within a baptized person. That's a different definition than uh, the secular world gives. For them, I think spirituality means trans anything, transcendent, trans uh, over uh, the rainbow of um, uh, personal uh, experience and whatnot. But for a Christian, spirituality is connected with a person, the third person, the Holy Spirit, the person of the baptized. So mystical doesn't mean just a character trait that only some people have. He has red hair, uh, he has a talent to play the trombone, Uh, he uh, flies off the handle, is kind of angry. It's not mystical, it's in a character trait. Some people are uh, a little moved by uh, things that ordinary people skip. No, mystical means that theology is made possible by the church's experience of herself as communion of the Holy Spirit. I want to bring uh, spirituality and mysticism down to an ecclesial home. Uh, Here is another uh, way I tried to say it. Uh, I realize how many things I've uh, thought of to try to grab the attention of college students, and I don't know whether that's uh, necessary anymore. But I thought um, most people have an understanding of spirituality in a kind of a uh, California Uh, sense. I hope no viewers are in California and are going to take offense at me. I'm just using the caricature of um, a loose, uh, in touch with myself and nature kind of. Uh, That kind of spirituality feels to me like it has all the uh, structure or strength or firmness of a jellyfish. Christian spirituality is vertebrate spirituality. It has an asceticism and it has a sacramental construction that's accomplished by the Holy Spirit. Mystical doesn't mean spirituality in myself. It means bringing myself into the church's experience. And the church is a communion of the Holy Spirit. So when the mystic is in communion with the church, then his or her liturgical theology is by definition mystical. Communion with the church makes for mystical. Therefore, our piety, piety meaning uh, obedience or loyalty towards God, our piety is driven outward, not just inward, because our piety follows the Holy Spirit. 
Uh, if I could make tracks, I would write them out here, but I can't. Uh, I follow the tracks of the Holy Spirit, and where is he going in, on an evangelical mission? Liturgy is centrifugal, not centripetal. And that's why Schmemann thinks that the liturgical movement has appeared everywhere closely bound up with a theological, missionary, and spiritual revival. The liturgical movement stands on, uh, it yields these three goods. It's been the source of a greater realization by Christians of their responsibility in the world. And that means a revival of the church herself. Not salvation from the world, but salvation of the world. Mimic Christ. Well, that's a notion of um, liturgical spirituality and uh, will make it uh, apply to the uh, mystical material now. Asceticism plays its background role, as the quote already indicates. So uh, three definitions of asceticism, so you don't have to watch the entire other series. Olivier Clement puts it so nicely when he says that asceticism is awakening from the sleepwalking of daily life. Asceticism enables the word to clear the silt away in the depth of the soul, freeing the spring of living waters. Uh, I've never dug a well, but I've played in mud puddles or uh, edges of a lake that has silt, and uh, it's very easily stirred up and it makes the uh, water uh, dirty and not cleared. While well, asceticism, uh, your soul accumulates uh, silt by its day in, day out uh, temptations of the world, and asceticism clears it away. The Word is the one who is acting, but we have to co act with Him. And our cooperation is not so much an exertion of willpower, it's a loving attentiveness. Asceticism as vigilance. A nice quote. My uh, application of it then, asceticism is watchfulness, wakefulness, loving vigilance over the interior conversations that we have. Everybody has interior conversations going on. It's funny to uh, pause and think, uh, why am I thinking about this right now and try to go back five steps? Uh, what was it about the weather that reminded me about uh, uh, Joe Johnson? Well, I, I moved from X to Y to Z to A to B to M, and now I've arrived here. We all have this interior conversation going on. Asceticism is having a vigilance over that conversation so that we can let God into it. God has a resolute desire to be let into that interior conversation. Am I talking here about um, uh, spiritualism or about mysticism? Yes. God knocks at the door to the interior part of our soul and requests permission to enter. The visitation and fiat that Mary experienced happens over and over again. Oh dear, uh, knocking at the door just reminded me of something. I read this uh, just recently as uh, part of my uh, working in these uh, past years with a group that I call Theologians of Abnegation, and this is by uh, a Franciscan named Francisco de Asuno, Asuna, Third Spiritual Alphabet. And in his ninth treatise, he has this material um, here. We are certain and know by the mouth of the Son of God himself that he and the Father and the Holy Spirit will come to dwell with one who loves them and will make their abode with him in no other place but in his soul, which is the dwelling place of God. But the man himself must be there to receive him. What a great uh, solution to the old um, grace or uh, works Augustine Pelagius controversy. It's all God, but the man himself must be there to receive him. I find uh, one difference between the robber in the parable, a thief is coming and uh, you, you would be take care to be home uh, so that no one climbs into the windows. And Os De Osuna writes, I find one difference between the uh, thief in Jesus' parable and the spiritual coming of the Lord. 
which, as Job says, is a visitation that preserves the spirit. The difference is that the robber is most anxious to enter the house when the master is absent. But our Lord God, who is exceedingly courteous, does not choose to come into our hearts unless we are within, awaiting him. Then, as he tells us in Revelations, Behold, I stand at the gate and knock, at the gate of our consent, in order that we may receive him more willingly. Yet when a man is not recollected, nor dwells within his own heart, he makes Christ stand at the door and seems to mock him while he calls to the soul, Open to me, and we close to him. I read that uh, since the time that I uh, wrote this um, book on mysticism, and uh, I wanted to add that quote because it popped into my mind. Uh, not always, but sometimes I think while I talk, and uh, right there I was thinking. Evdokimov says that asceticism is the reconstruction in us of the image of God. Reconstruction of an image that has been uh, besmirched or muddied. Well, Gerigou Lagrange says that uh, Western theology made a mistake in the 17th and 18th centuries. And that this is the mistake, he thinks. We thought that ordinary Christians are only concerned with ascetical theology, but extraordinary Christians are concerned with mystical theology. What does Mrs. Murphy do? Well, she just slogs it out, uh, working through the ascetical disciplines of the virtues and vices day after day. But some extraordinary Christians uh, levitate into mystical theology and extraordinary graces. Ascetical theology treats of exercises leading to perfection in the ordinary way, while mystical theology treats of extraordinary way infused contemplation. Gerigou Lagrange disagrees with that. He thinks that that was a... Um, uh, rabbit hole off the track in the uh, 17th to 18th century. From this point of view, asceticism doesn't lead to mysticism, and the perfection or ordinary union to which it leads is normally an end in itself and not a disposition to a more intimate and more elevated union, and therefore mystical theology is of importance only to some rare privileged souls. Uh, Gergou Lagrange got me off on this by saying that was a, uh, an error in our way of thinking. If that's the case, however, we might just as well ignore it to avoid presumption and confusion. If this is not the case, that mysticism, mystical theology, only belongs to some rare and privileged souls, then uh, to whom does it belong? I'm going to say to baptismal souls to liturgical souls, to Christian souls, to spiritual souls, well, that would be uh, people who are in the church seeking the perfection of the graces that they received. So here's my point. Um, it's not proper to think that Mrs. Murphy can't be a theologian or an ascetic or a mystic or even uh, exercise the royal priesthood that she receives in baptism. Rather, uh, she lives a life expected of every one of the baptized. And the ultimate end of that life is the supreme beatitude. It's a life all the baptized share. A life within which the professed ascetic or the uh, extraordinary mystic, I'm uh, blending them together, the professed ascetic is nothing more or less than a virtuoso who serves the whole community as an exemplar of the community's own life. Uh, virtuoso could be my uh, way of uh, doing it. Uh, not a theologian for not being... This is an error. She is a theologian, though not an academic. Ascetic, though not religious. She's a mystic, though not one of the virtuosos. You like that? You can try it. Ascetic. The ascetic is simply a stunningly normal person 
who stands in constant witness to the normality of Christian orthodoxy in a world that's flawed into abnormality. The world is crooked, and liturgy stands a person straight. So the holiness and mystery offered to all the baptized is an objective gift that will be lived out in an exceptional manner by some, especially graced mystics. This is me now, a section from the chapter in the book. Just as asceticism will be lived out in an exceptional manner by some gifted monks. But the ascetic in the desert does not do anything that the baptized person is not also supposed to do. He only does it differently. Not does not equal. Not a different thing, but rather the thing differently. The monk and the Christian in the world, the virtuoso mystic and Mrs. Murphy do not do different things. They do the same thing, but differently, in a different way. The extraordinary mystic does not know a different reality than is known by the baptized person. He only knows it with a different force and charisma, which is granted him by God. But why? Not as a reward, not for his own uh, ego, but to serve the whole community. A stunningly normal person standing in constant witness. So it's normal for a baptized Christian to be a mystic and an ascetic and a theologian. Normal in the sense of natural, ordered, something you should expect. Uh, Bartholomew Froger wrote this little book on the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, and he had a nice line, and so I steal uh, recklessly. The soul of every person, no matter when he lived or what degree of holiness he acquired, whether he attained to the heights of perfection or whether he was just entering upon the road of righteousness, whether an adult or an infant, <clears throat> the soul of every person baptized is united with God through grace and entertains as his guest, if he's home, to open the door when the Trinity knocks. True, this union can be more or less perfect. <clears throat> That's why there's a uh, hierarchy of degrees. It can admit of degrees which vary ad infinitum, <clears throat> but the mystical union everywhere and always is essentially the same. Could be a difference in degree, but not a difference in kind. <clears throat> I thought of an illustration to describe it like uh, white light. You know that uh, the white light contains all the colors of the rainbow within it, and when it runs through the um, um, prism, uh, then uh, red, orange, yellow, blue, green, uh, sorry, blue, indigo, Roy G. Biv, I was trying to read, uh, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet. I reached all the way back to uh, junior high for that. Uh, then the uh, white light is broken into these uh, um, colors. Well, baptism is the white light, the piercing white light of Christ. And it breaks into our lives in different colors according to the prisms of our lives in according to the state of life in which we live. And it's going to be different for the sister in the convent than it is for the mother uh, in a family of kids. It's going to be, ex the color will be different, but the white light will be the same. It's coming from Christ. Christ is the light of the world who suffuses his whole church, but upon passing into some historical prism or a personal prism or a cultural prism, it's dispersed into a spectrum of saints. The white light contains all the colors before it's broken apart. The Christ's body contains all the spectrum of saints before it's broken apart. 
This was a, a quote from a book by Carl Adam. That's my copy I took a picture of. I found it in a used bookstore for 85 cents. What luck. It's been uh, republished by uh, Angelical Press, so there's the uh, more recent cover. Carl Adam uh, wrote this, I think, in 1925. Um, I paused to look it up. Uh, I was wrong by a year, 1924. It's nice in videos I can go and correct myself. If I was standing in front of a classroom, I can't say, oh, wait a minute, and I run back to my office and check the uh, copyright date and run back to the classroom. They'd have all left by now. It's another uh, nice example of uh, how um, paradox works, uh, how necessary paradox is to theology. Uh, he sets these uh, almost the way a century, uh, the example of century, uh, this kind of saint, but also this kind of saint, and also this kind of saint, nevertheless, yes, just these kinds of saints, how exceedingly various are the ways in which they followed Christ and manifold their forms. By the side of the saintly hermit and the ascetic of the desert sands the social saint, the saint of the great city and the industrial classes. By the side of the foreign missionary stands the saint who gave his life to cripples and uh, mental asylums and the criminals condemned to the galleys. By the side of the saint arrayed in robe of penance and rough girdle stands the saint of the salon, the refined and saintly man of the world. Are you uh, beginning to picture some of your favorite saints? By the side of the saint of strict enclosure and constant silence stands the joyous friar who calls a swallow his sister and the moon his brother. By the side of the saint of divine learning stands the saint who despised all knowledge save of Christ. Chesterton said uh, the Catholic Church is capacious enough, big enough, to uh, hold both Thomas and Francis. By the side of the contemplative mystic, mystics, world-conquering apostles. By the side of the saint who does penance in filth and rags, the saint robed in imperial purple and crowned with the glory of the tiara. By the side of the saint who fights and is slain, is the saint who suffers and dies for it. The side of the innocent saint stands the penitent saint. Both the innocent and the penitent saint express holiness. It's not just the innocent who expresses holiness. The one doing penance expresses holiness. Uh, perhaps that witness has been forgotten by the church. And by the uh, side of the saint of childlike meekness, there's the saint who wrestles with God until God blesses him. How infinitely various are all these saintly figures, and each one is marked with a stamp of his own time, some very plainly so, some so plainly so that we can't uh, any longer establish a genuinely sympathetic contact with them, for there is but one, uh, capital O, who is ever modern, never out of date, one only who belongs to all time. There are certain uh, icons I own which I say chose me. I didn't choose them, they chose me. I had a friend who was Orthodox who uh, said he gave to, his, they named their daughter Mary, and he gave to her the icon of Mary of Egypt, who uh, looks pretty rough, a little beat up. And he said, uh, my daughter can't appreciate it yet, but she will someday. Um uh, pick your popes. There are some popes with whom we have uh, sympathetic contact and others, oh, with the Middle Ages, that was so uh, fancy. We don't like that anymore. Uh, what God needed, God uh, established, and he used those various tools. I throw in this quote from Dorothy Sayers, uh, who is explaining what one of the angels meant when she accounted to Dante on his rise that there's no envy in heaven. There is equality in the sense that all the souls alike are as full of bliss as they're capable of being. But between soul and soul, there is no formal equality at all. The pint pot and the quart pot are equally full, but there's no pretense that a pint and a quart are the same thing. Neither does the pint ever dream of saying to the quart, I'm as good as you are, 
still less does it dream of saying, oh, it isn't fair that you should hold more than I. The old sin of envy is utterly extinguished in heaven. You want to live heaven on earth? The virtues will one by one extinguish the vices, extinguish envy, eliminate envy from your life, and uh, you'll begin to live a heavenly life. Columba Marmion defines faith as the light that reveals the divine thoughts to us and in return lets us penetrate further into God's design. When we contemplate the incarnate word at Bethlehem, let's rise above the things of sense and gaze upon him with the eyes of faith. And faith makes us share here below in the knowledge that the divine persons have of one another. I'm not exaggerating. I'm uh, uh, doing a... uh, rendition of Marmion's quote. Sanctifying grace makes us partakers of the divine nature, and the activity of the divine nature consists in the knowledge that the divine persons have the one of the other, and the love that they have one for the other. And we participate in this knowledge and in this love. In the knowledge and love that flows between the persons of the Trinity, in the perichoresis of the Trinity, we are given a uh, contact with, and uh, faith is a knowledge and a love that the Father has for the Son, and the Son for the Father, and the Holy Spirit for the Son, and the Son for the Holy Spirit, and we go through them all. Grace enables us to behold deep down into these mysteries through the eyes of God. Deep down into the mysteries. It's almost like if you could see deep down into the mysteries, I could call you a mystic. So what's the payoff? This is the payoff. This is why I'm doing it. We can make the question, what happens in liturgy, more precise. We can make the question, what happens to us in liturgy? A fountain of light spouts forth rays of truth. John Chrysostom image. And the liturgical mystic swims this liturgical river upstream. If you're not offended by the homely quality of the uh, illustration, when the soldier pierced the side of Christ and water and blood came forth, it set loose a stream that a Christian soul can swim upstream like a salmon, swimming upstream into the heart of Christ. Liturgy is the activity of the church. The church is the mystical body of Christ. Liturgical mysticism is the activity of the mystical body in Christ, in the church, and in each individual member. So church liturgy is corporate, ritualized, and symbolic. Liturgical mysticism is personal, spiritualized, and ascetic. And these operate together. No choices. I've been presenting them so far as uh, what people perceive as uh, alternatives, choose this or choose that, or as mutual ends of the magnet repelling each other. Now I want to say in a good century form of paradox, they cooperate. Church liturgy requires institutions. Liturgical mysticism produces saints. Church liturgy sacramentally brings heaven to earth, catabasis. Mysticism mystically translates a person from earth to heaven, anabasis. Liturgy offers Eucharistic food for consumption characters for empowered mission and the healing of soul and body. Uh, These are the um, groups of sacraments. Liturgical mysticism is for personal perfection. My definition of liturgy, the catechism's definition of liturgy, the grace of Christ, the gratuitous gift that God makes to us of his own life, infused by the Holy Spirit into our soul, God's own life is infused into our soul by the Holy Spirit to heal it of sin and to sanctify it. This is the deifying grace received in baptism. Well, uh, Corbon writes us in the final vision, John glimpses the energy of the Blessed Trinity at the heart of the Messianic Jerusalem. If we let the river of life permeate us, we become trees of life, for the mystery which the river symbolizes takes hold of us. You as a 
tree planted by baptism uh, suck up the water of this river and you become a tree of life. And now he says the river is given a name. Christmas is the coming of the river of life in our flesh. And then the liturgy has been born. The resurrection of Jesus, its first manifestation. What's the first manifestation of liturgy? The resurrection of Jesus. Do you want to do liturgy? Yes, I'd like to be connected with the resurrection of Christ. Because that's the power which the river of life exercises in the humanity of the risen Christ. That's liturgy. I'm going to uh, come to this final question because it leads to a uh, answer in the next uh, video, but here's the uh, setup for it. Where should we find liturgical mysticism? Well, it's lapping the shores of the baptismal font. Remember from the river pouring down into the uh, baptismal font and uh, over the edges. Liturgical mysticism is lapping the shores like you can remember as a kid, uh, waves lapping the uh, shores of the lake. Liturgical mysticism begins with your entry into the perichoresis of the Trinity, which is liturgy. That perichoresis canonically extended to invite our ascent. Liturgical mysticism is the stamp of Christ incarnate life placed on us. It's heaven's descension, and mysticism is humanity's ascension. Liturgy is heaven's descension. Mysticism is humanity's ascension. Liturgical mysticism, up and down. Catabasis, uh, anabasis. That's why liturgy and mysticism need to be connected, because heaven and earth need to be connected, because the coming down and the ascension must be connected. So there are some ways to think about this given to us by Gregory the Great in his uh, big book on the Moralia in Job. He gives us uh, three sets of pairings, inward, outward, above, below, then, and now. In our sinful state, we tend to operate out of the second term in each of those pairings. We only think about what's outward and we ignore the interior life. We only think about what's here below, uh, secular, on earth. And we only think about now, this moment, the next moment, what should I be doing now? We direct our life outward towards things that they uh, dazzle us in the present moment. Uh, that's the now. And then um, we actually are living below our dignity. And we mistakenly conclude that the world outside us is more important than the world within, uh, that the present passing moment is of more consequence than uh, eternal moments, which we compile in our spiritual experiences. And we uh, think that the world below is the ultimate reality. Well, Gregory offers a different vision, a vision of an inward life that rises above into what we will know in the eschaton at the parousia. There's a breakthrough required to uh, uh, get out of each of these. We must turn from outward to inward. If we wish to contemplate things within, let's take a rest from our outward engagements. When the mind is at rest from its outward employments, then the weight of the divine precepts, the law of God, is more fully discerned. If we want to turn from below to above, for the human creature, by this alone, that it is a creature, it is inherent in itself to sink down below itself as a creature. But man has obtained from his creator that he should be both caught above himself by contemplation and held fast in himself by incorruption. Our natural uh, creaturely sense, our carnal sense, sinks but we're to be made uh, light enough to float. And to make this switch, we must lift our eyes from now to then. The church of the elect will then be fully day when the shade of sin no longer blends with it. Fully day when it has been brightened by the warmth of this inward light. Yet, another antinomy, another paradox, a century format also for Gregory, 
he combines and mingles these in a way that surprises us. He would, you would think that he's going to tell us, uh, do without that, do without that, do without that, only live an inward, above, and then life. But he mixes them up in a way that surprises us. If you think of heaven only as above, he reminds us that heaven is within. The kingdom of God is within you. Oh, I, I thought you said don't look at it down here, but up there, yeah, but it's within you. Uh, if you think of heaven as within, because you just obeyed him in the first step, he reminds you that it's still to come. We don't have it yet. Oh, okay, so if you think that it'll be later, then he tells us, no, it's already present. It's a wonderful mix that he accomplishes. Mysticism is uh, life in the kingdom. Where do you live? In South Bend. Where do you live? Massachusetts. Where do you live? In the kingdom. That's the mystical home of life. And that kingdom is still to come, but it's already present. And it's above, but it's within. It's a mystery. It's a surpriser. Eastern theologian Nicholas Cabasilis gives an image that I think might assist us. What happens to the saint on his rebirth is like what happens in the womb at the first birth. And so um, he imagines the fetus thinking. And I took his uh, brief quote and then I uh, enlarged it uh, because I was so fascinated by it. When I read his uh, suggestion, I had to close the book and uh, stare out the window for a little while. You can imagine the baby within the womb thinking, oh, why do these bones continue to grow? They only cramp up the space I have. What are these legs for? They're no use to me here. What's this nose for when I have nothing to smell? These eyes when it's totally dark in this womb. The lungs are ill-suited to this liquid environment. It's a waste to be developing these when they're of no use to me in my present life, in my present condition. Oh, what the baby doesn't know. And we think it's a waste to be developing these things when they're of no use to me in my present life, in my present condition. Oh, what we do not know. So here's Cabasilis's quote. When the unborn have no perception whatever of this life, the blessed ones have many hints in this present life. The, the baby couldn't even imagine it because he's got no hint of what life outside the womb is like. We at least have a hint of what life beyond this world will be like. The unborn don't possess this life. It's holy in the future. So there's no ray of light, anything that sustains. But in our case, this isn't, isn't so. The future light is infused into this present life and mingled with it. And that's mysticism. Why does God do it? So that we can be disposed and prepared for it. Liturgy is the active presence now of an eschatological reality. Liturgy is the kenosis, the self-emptying and coming down of the transcendent creator within his cosmos. And liturgy is the activity below of heaven above, the presence in the mundane of supernatural things. I could conclude with an image that uh, Ephraim the Syrian gave. Uh, this was uh, one that he gave of robes. He says that the entire cosmic drama can be summed up in the story of four robes. This is a, a description of it by... Um, summary of it by Sebastian Brock in his book on Ephraim. Uh, I found a uh, uh, image for each of these if I did it as a PowerPoint slide. In the fall, Adam and Eve lose the robe of glory with which they had originally been clothed in paradise. In order to reclothe the naked Adam and Eve, humanity, God himself puts on the body from Mary. And in the baptism, Christ laid the robe of glory in the River Jordan, making it available again for us to put on at baptism. If there's a um, bad oil leak into a river, it runs downstream into all the little um, 
um, uh, uh, areas where the river flows. Uh, I imagine Christ going into the Jordan to be baptized by John, laying his body in the Jordan River so that his hypostatic union can float downstream and pool up in every baptismal font wherever it's found in the world. By lying in the tomb, he sanctified all graves. By lying in the Jordan, he sanctified all baptismal fonts, which is the third one. At his or her baptism, the individual Christian puts on Christ, the robe of glory, and re-enters the terrestrial anticipation of the eschatological paradise. That would make a nice t-shirt, wouldn't it? I belong to the terrestrial anticipation of the eschatological paradise, the church on earth anticipating the paradise which is coming in the eschaton. And finally, at the last day, the resurrection of the dead, the just will re-enter the celestial paradise clothed in their robes of glory. Nice summary of um, fall, redemption, sacrament, resurrection. Christ is the person who is, makes up the mysticism of liturgy, of Christianity, and the person comes to us in liturgy. In the hierarchical liturgy that goes from the heavenly throne to the church's sacraments and her ritual celebration. In the mystical liturgy, coming from that same throne into our own personal reality. In visible liturgy, by the action of a visible hierarchy, authorized by Christ when the priesthood was handed to his apostles and in an invisible liturgy which occurs in every Christian soul. So an external sacramental liturgy brings power to the interior personal liturgy. And the interior personal liturgy brings life to the exterior sacramental liturgy. Letter and spirit, body and soul. Liturgical asceticism makes us into granules of mystical incense to burn in glorification before God. And the mysticism perfects our liturgy. Why do liturgists want mystics around to perfect their liturgy? Why do mystics want liturgists around to ground them? Ground them, uh, roots of a tree. I'm looking at a tree out uh, my uh, window here now, and the uh, roots are fixed by liturgy, but the uh, branches have grown up towards heaven and the leaves, as I record this, have begun to pop. Liturgy, mysticism, foundation, perfection, growth. Liturgists like the company of mystics. Mystics seek the company of liturgists. I wonder if I can say uh, more about this. Is there a way to uh, unpack it further? Oh, you know there is, or I wouldn't have asked the question.